Welcome to another episode of Foolproof Theology. I'm your host, Chase Davis. It's great to be with you here today. I'm really excited about our conversation, a really important conversation on race in the church. This is something that uh, really was exposed back in 2020 as a major issue, but it's been an issue going on for years in the evangelical church. And just to honor the spirit of the day, I'm wearing my Anglo 8 shirt, if you can see that, uh, for my Twitter uh, follower who made that shirt for me, sent it to me. Thank you uh, for that. And I, uh, I'm keeping my end of the bargain. He said, <laughs> wear it on air and I'll make it for you. So I'm wearing it on air to talk about these matters. Um, and, and maybe we'll get into that and MLK 50 in this, in this uh, conversation with David Schrock. David, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey man, glad to be with you, Chase. Really looking forward to it. So David, you're the pastor of uh, preaching and theology at Akakwan. Is that how you said it? Akakwan Bible Church? Yeah. Occoquan Bible Church, Occoquan. just south of Washington, D.C. I know. Every, everybody misses it. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> Great. Um, you're a twice graduate of uh, Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and you got your MDiv and PhD. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. And what was your PhD in there? Yeah, so systematic theology. So did a dissertation under Steve Wellam on biblical theology of the priesthood trying to answer the question, what does the extent of the atonement? So argued for definite atonement on the basis of that. Oh, lovely. I love good books on definite atonement. There's one, yeah. I think it's by Long. Is that, uh, does that yeah. ring a bell? Yeah, Gary Long. Yeah, this is a good book. Yeah. Yeah, I, I recommend that because it's relatively short. I give it out at my church when people have questions on definite atonement. It always seems to be the one that keep, trips people up, you know, in the, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. if you want to use the tulip schema. Uh, yep. that's, that's the one. So, uh, we'll appreciate that. Did you ever get that published anywhere or is that just searchable online? Yeah. So you can find that online at the, the library there at Southern seminary. Uh, my biblical theology on priesthood showed up in the short studies in biblical theology in the crossway series. And then I'm working on a book on definite atonement right now that, uh, is long overdue, but Lord willing, I'll get to that in the next year. Excellent. Well, I look forward to reading that. Yeah, it's fun. I don't know, at Southern, do they print a hard copy and put it on the shelves in the library once you do they a do. dissertation? Yeah, yeah, you can find it there. It's very fun. I know it's, yeah. uh, it's a niche uh, reality for students because when they did it at Denver Seminary for my THM thesis, mm -hmm. I like took my family and I was like, look, sons, <laughs> here's my work. <laughs> like, nobody else cares, but good you know, it, it's a significant deal. So congratulations on doing yeah, that. And thank good. you for your, uh, your contribution. And that mm -hmm. way you've also made another contribution recently. You wrote a book called dividing the faithful. Um, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Um, I read through it. It's really helpful. It's a response to, um, a book that was really popular, uh, that came out called divided by faith. And this was very popular. So we want to get into that. I want to talk about this book with, with you. But in the intro, you you highlight your own journey. And so yeah. I wanted to hear about that a little bit. Um, and I want to focus in on T4G. You're at T4G with David Platt. Um, before we get to that, maybe yeah. walk me through. You've been a pastor for 10, 20 years. What, what was your journey with Divided by Faith? How did you hear that come up? Yeah. So, I mean, so being at Southern Seminary, I think that was the epicenter of the young neo-Calvinist movement, young reform, restless, all of that goodness. Uh, and so went to together for the gospel for multiple years uh, as a seminary student and then as a pastor in Southern Indiana. Uh, and so we'd go there every couple of years. I was always deeply encouraged by that, deeply thankful uh, for those gatherings and the impact that together for the gospel had. 2018, I had moved to be a pastor in Northern, Northern Virginia. Um, and so we brought about 20 guys uh, from our church at that time and had just a, a sweet time that was there. Uh, and yet that was the 50th anniversary of MLK's uh, death. Uh, so MLK 50 happened about a month before, which was the event in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, that the ERLC, uh, along with TGC, put together to commemorate that and to really celebrate the life of Martin Luther King. And so there was just lots of discussions going on about race. And you know, certainly from about 2013 of Trayvon Martin to 2018, uh, you know, so many names uh, that were dropped and so many videos that were put on, especially through social media. So that decade from, let's say, just 2010 to 2020, and it happens still today, I think the impact of social media just change the the temperature of the way that things would just, the flashpoint would happen so much quicker and pastors were having to say things so much faster. Uh, so all of those things were kind of feeding into that. 2018 happens uh, together for the gospel and David Platt, uh, who we talk about definite atonement there a couple of years earlier, maybe it was 2012. Uh, he preached a great message on definite atonement and how that leads to risking uh, for the sake of the gospel. And so kind of sat in there expecting just an, another really good message that was there. And what happened, was really an exposition of this book divided by faith. 
So Divided by Faith is a book that came out in 2000, and it had an impact. I know uh, Ardell Kennedy tells about how it deeply impacted uh, Bethlehem um, Baptist Church up there in Minneapolis uh, and how that was influencing and how he responded to that and, and others. So there are faithful brothers who are responding to that. But it really continued to just be in the ecosystem um, of evangelicals to say that if you're going to understand and address the issue of black and white relations in the church, which we know has been you know, fraught with challenges in the history of America, this is the book that you need to read because it really puts a finger on something. And so probably a year earlier, uh, I had been given that book, commended that book in some pastors gatherings and you know those who are leading uh, together for the gospel, guys like Mark Dever and Lig Duncan and others who are certainly talking about these things. That's how the book came across my my path. And I'd read it and uh, had done some preaching at my own church on just racial reconciliation. Uh, and along the way was planning to do something like a message that I saw David Platt preach uh, there at Together for the Gospel. I was teed up to do that probably the next January. Uh, and then I saw that and realized, oh, there's something deeply wrong about that, especially in context to the way that Lig Duncan addressed some of the same issues, but he did so from a biblical exegesis uh, of the text of scripture. Uh, and realized, okay, that was kind of the, the change point for me and began to do more research and reading and thinking about these things and realizing, oh, there's a lot more to, to be said about this. There's not a monolithic view uh, of race and you know a black view and a white view, which is something that comes out in the book Divided by Faith. So that's kind of a long answer to kind of what was happening in 2018, uh, but that was a tipping point. I talked about that in the intro to the book uh, for me to begin thinking about these things in a different way. Yeah, that makes complete sense. I think, you know, it's really hard for me to look back and listeners know, hold on, I'm going to let my dog out real quick. <laughs> uh, listeners know from uh, from a previous episode, I did one called, uh, you can go look it up, Boom Roasted, uh, because mm. I wrote a uh, an article back, you know, uh, some years ago uh, after one of these cultural events uh, where um, there was a lot of pressure on pastors to issue a statement. And man, the whole article back then was all riddled and, you know, listen and learn and do all of this. And so I just read it on air and then responded to myself where I am mm -hmm. now yeah. uh, as kind of a confessional, which I kind of view your book as a bit that way. Like, here's where I was. Here's where I am now. Here's how I'm thinking about it now. Um, was there anything in that talk particularly that Platt gave? Because I've heard a lot of these guys speak, whether it's uh, Russell Moore, Lincoln Duncan, all this, all these kind of uh, big evangelical guys that have a, a wide distribution network and a platform. Was there anything in particular in that talk where all of a sudden you, a flip, uh, a switch flipped for you that you were like, uh, you know, hopefully it was just the Holy Spirit convicting you. But like, what what would you identify in that talk that really helped you? Yeah, it's interesting. The the penny dropped for me when Lig Duncan preached. And then was able to look back at the difference between those two. One being, you know, soundly from the scriptures. And I would say today, you know, there's some concerns that I would have of where he was at that time. Even the the forward that he gave to um, Eric Mason's book, Woke Church. Right? So, so Ligon was certainly affirming some of these things. I think he's walked away from that since then. Um, but one was biblical exegetical and, and the other was just sociological. Uh, and that just became so clear. And then so looking back at David's message, it was after both of those in comparison that really became clear at that point um, to say, yeah, I mean, so in a in a conference, I think it is fair to preach something that is not exegetical. You could do something more topical. You can certainly do historical, biographical, all the rest different than Sunday by Sunday preaching in, in the Lord's service. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it was something that just became very evident that that is not the way that I, you know, have been trained or taught or am convicted from the scriptures, that it's the scriptures that are, are leading us in that way. So it was the com the combination of two of those uh, things that were most um, most revelatory. Yeah. So with with that kind of shift or that kind of like, oh, wow, I'm seeing this in a different light or I feel conviction about a way maybe I've been led and now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of shifting gears. Mm -hmm. One thing that kind of haunts me. Um, and I, I refer to myself as young, but honestly, in the scope of history, I would be considered an old man, um, <laughs> given how long people live. But like, I always want to be somebody who's humble, who's teachable, who can listen to the best ideas and ultimately, you know, find uh, my footing, my foundation in the word of God, the authority of Christ, the lordship of Christ overall. What does it look like, though, especially for someone like me that has bought that did buy into a lot of this stuff, maybe not as rapidly as others? Mm -hmm. But I was doing the whole listening, learning stuff. And now all of a sudden, you know, I'm I'm definitely 
uh, not woke. <laughs> and, and even you, you might say to you, to borrow their term, they use anti-racist. I would be anti-woke. Um, <laughs> what would you, how would you encourage someone to, uh, you know, be confident after that? Because honestly, the temptation for me is like, well, shoot, you know, I, I look back and I, I feel fairly duped, uh, like somebody pulled a blinder over my eye. So it elicits feelings of anger, uh, betrayal, uh, sadness. And, and what does that say about me if I was so easily deceived? So how do you walk through that as someone yourself who's a lifelong learner, mm -hmm. curious about things? Uh, what does that look like in your life to, to, to remain confident and yet humble in the Lord as you continue to mature and grow? Yeah, I think there are lots of things to kind of think through there. Uh, at least one is that God has to be sovereign in our salvation and our sanctification. Uh, and I think, you know, we are reformed in our soteriology, um, you know, certainly there's a recognition that in our sanctification, we play a part in that when we've been made alive in Christ, we're putting to death the deeds of the flesh by the power of the spirit. But there's also a reality that he is the one who's sovereign in our sanctification too. Uh, and, you know, I've talked to many people in church and been a pastor for almost uh, 15 years, right? I mean, many like, why didn't I learn these things earlier? And it's because God in his sovereignty decided to reveal these things to you later. Um, and, and so that should produce in us a kind of humility and an absolute trust and dependence on God. I mean, so in the book, I mentioned the fact that, you know, I was deceived and duped in college as well with regards to open theism. Um, and and it, it reminds us that who we spend our time with, who, the books that we're reading really do have a huge impact on us. Uh, and that's why it's so critical for pastors to put good books in the hands of their people, uh, to be aware uh, of what people are reading in, in the pews uh, and to be able to address those things uh, along the way. Uh, because we are not meant to, to be individual Christians who are figuring these things out all by ourselves. God is one who's sovereign, but he sovereignly uses means to, to bring about that sanctification uh, through local churches, through books, through different things uh, that are influencing us. And so we should perhaps be cautious of what is influencing us, who we are listening to, what are the impact that we have. Paul gives us great examples in the scriptures, especially in the pastoral epistles, to look at the character of the life of those who are teaching us. Is it producing a fruit? What is the fruit uh, that is in their lives? What is the impact on their children? What is the impact on their wife? So all of these things matter. Uh, and, and then still people can be mistaken about a certain area. Uh, they can have good fruit, they can have good theology, and they can just be misled in some of these things. And so I do think it's important to, to be patient uh, with people and gracious in that. So I'm writing this book for friends uh, who walk through seminary together, maybe who have been deeply influenced by the MLK 50, who have, are not anti-woke. I think in our culture today uh, that it is necessary to be anti-woke in order to continue to walk straight and narrow. I don't think you can just be neutral on these things because the entirety of the culture is pulling the church. And we've seen this uh, in a leftward direction uh, that is antithetical to the message of, of Scripture, of the truth, of right and wrong, all of these things. So I think it's necessary to be in those ways. But I just fall back to the fact that God is sovereign. And I'm trusting that the same God who found me when I was not seeking him for my salvation is continuing to lead me in my day to day life. Uh, I want to avoid those places of error. I can learn from things in the past, but ultimately my hope is not in perfectly figuring these things out, but trusting in a perfect God who's going to lead me to um, to glory. Yeah, amen, brother. I mean, I think with with that word, you know, when you think about the kind of the landscape, if uh if these pastors were to come to you today and they were to say, we hear you, um, think of some of these big names. So let's say, you know, all these people that, that you've named in the book that you, we've talked about on air, if they were all to sit you down and meet with you and, uh, and say, what should we do now? You know, mm -hmm. and I think my heart is more inclined to like, you should publicly recant, <laughs> you know, but I don't know if that's more of a, a vengeful spirit that I shouldn't have or, you know, it's something I try to model where, where I kind of publicly go, Hey, I used to think this. Now I think this, I, I think it's, I think there's something to that. What would you recommend if there's a pastor listening that once taught these things now doesn't, what do you think his responsibility is as a preacher and teacher of God's word, um, as he matures and grows and has changed his mind on these things? What would you like to see happen? Yeah. So I think in principle, if you are a teacher and you have taught error, you need to go back and to pull out the weeds that you have sown by the seeds of error that you have sown. And that's really simple for someone who is just a, a small teacher, small group leader, right? Because you know who the people who are there, it hasn't had a huge impact. I mean, again, when I bought into open theism, 
Uh, I was simply, you know, leading Bible studies on my college campus. And so I know one person who bought into that. I went back to him to say, look, this is wrong, right? Really simple when it's that size. But we do have ministries that are impacting, if not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, uh, and becomes far more difficult. And, you know, the human nature is, is one that we don't want to go back into say, especially when it's that large. But I think those who have had that kind of impact at that scale would still do well, not to just kind of change what they're saying, but to be able to say, hey, those things I said before, uh, that wasn't really helpful. Uh, and in fact, I'm changing the way that I'm thinking about these things. Uh, and I would encourage others to do that too. I mean, one of the things that people who have read this book, you know, and have been impacted by, let's just say the leaders of T4G say, you know, are my church, do, do we get away from all these? Like, I think each church is going to be different on that, right? So, I mean, I would simply say that today, our church still uses the ecclesial works that Nine Marks produces. Deeply thankful for that. When it comes to elders and deacons and, you know, all the, the polity of the local church, we use that, commend that, be thankful for that. Um, but there may be other things that we don't use that are related to other cultural facing issues uh, in a different way. So I'm not going to kind of tell everyone what they must do. But for those who have taught error, I think there's just a principle to say that you should go back and undo the error that you have taught as much as you can. Yeah, I agree with that. I, you know, I think when you mentioned nine marks and uh, I can mention the Gospel Coalition, it's really hard uh, today compared to where we were in ministry, uh, maybe even 10 years ago, where I could just kind of throw out some websites for people and some resources to people and just go, yeah, read, uh, you know, look at the T4G websites. If you're interested in sanctification or I'm not T4G uh, Gospel Coalition, uh, just type in sanctification and some good stuff will come up. And now I have to be much more discerning. And it can be jarring for some people because they're like, but you used to really like everything they wrote. And I'm like, yeah, just they're people, man. They're not they're not perfect. They're just people. And so uh, so I think that's a good word uh, for for our listeners on that with with your book, particularly with Divided by Faith. I want to get into a couple of the arguments um, because you give out 47 uh, theses. It's, it's funny. We're, we're <laughs> recording this on Reformation Day. And yeah. <laughs> so this is like David Schrock nailing this to the church door. So it's um, half of 95, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so I'm not sure uh, what church door we need to go nail this upon. Yeah, yeah. It feels like we should. Um, but I, I wanted to go through a few of these. And it's a it's a relatively, just for, for the listeners out there, it's a relatively short book uh, compared to a lot of works out there. And it's, it's, it's decimating. I don't think David would describe it that way because he's a scholar and, uh, you know, <laughs> He's a respectable man, but it really is in terms of its impact and how he exposes the lies within. So it's a really important work, and I'd encourage you to go read it if you've been impacted by uh, Divided by Faith. But I just want to get into a couple of them. One of them deals with how we redefine racialization so that the mm -hmm. cross of Christ no longer effectively reconciles. How does Divided by Faith, when we read that book, how does Divided by Faith redefine racialization? so that the cross doesn't effectively reconcile. Yeah, so a couple of things. I think one, it introduces the term of racialization, right? So it's redefining what racism is. And one of the things that it's going to argue is that racism up into the 1960s in America was overt, right? It was very clear uh, the laws that were prejudicial against African-Americans, those of, you know, um, black skin in our country. And that changed in the 1960s with the different laws that were being passed at that point. But racism didn't go away. Now it is, you know, covert. It's even, you know, it's everywhere. It's in the structures of everything in society. Uh, and so therefore, we need to be kind of looking around for these things. So no longer is attached to an individual or people and the agency that is there. It's just in the air that we breathe, the water that we drink. It, it is everywhere. And so racialization is as plain as day, they want to say. Um, but what I think is important to realize uh, is that racialization is a term that they get from someone by the name of Eduardo Benia Silva. Uh, and so he's the one they depend upon. And Silva, over the last 20 years, has become a leading proponent of critical race theory. So he has six or seven uh, editions worth of a book called Racism Without Racists. And so they are the ones that, um, or he is the one that they depend upon to define that on page nine of the book. And that's going to be the lens through which they look at everything through the rest of the book. It's not defined biblically, uh, it's defined sociologically. Uh, and so in that regard, um, 
it's important to see that critical race theory, which you know has come to the prominence over the last, let's say, five, 10 years, and we know it by name and we know what the system of that is, um, we didn't know that when this book was being put out or that it's laced throughout the entirety of the book because it never uses those terms. It is before some of those terms crystallized over the last 10 years or so. And so what I think is important, and just historically note, I mean, critical race theory goes back to, um, you know, critical legal studies in the 1970s uh, and, and others. But for evangelicals, it has come to the forefront last five to 10 years. So I think it's important to realize that this is something I would argue is the, the gateway drug to bring these ideas into the church. And instead of allowing the scriptures, if, it, if the Bible provides a biblical anthropology, I would argue it also provides a biblical sociology. But we don't have as many books that have helped to kind of fill that gap. And so with that hole in our thinking, this book produced that. And so when that is brought forward, what that does is say the problem is the sociological relationships of, you know, uh, prejudice or power or, you know, uh, just uh, disparity. And the way that we solve that is by, well, we can't just do it with friendships. That's one of the things that they criticize in the book. What we need to do is actually to change the structures. And that usually becomes an economic reality. And of course, what that does is to deny the fact that sin is the root of all of this and that sin, the Bible defines what the problem is. Uh, so when we're thinking about the gospel, the gospel not only is the solution, but it's also the definition of the problem. And the definition is related to humanity uh, and every single one of us who are born in Adam. And that's our only hope for bringing true reconciliation between individuals or even cultures as people are brought out from various cultures into the people of God in the church. Uh, and with that, there is a group sanctification, learning how to be in Christ uh, and not just imitating Jesus in his work of reconciliation, but actually coming to embrace the reconciliation that he gives to us as we say no to where we've come from now to be found in Christ. And that's not to deny that there are good things that culture may give to us, but it is to prioritize what scripture says to us to understand who we are in our humanity and our sociology and our ecclesiology. All of those things need to be defined by scripture, and that's what divided by faith doesn't do. Yeah, so when we're looking at scripture then, and we think about these words that are thrown out today, you know, you'll get a lot of uh, words that, that the world will accuse Christians of, you know, bigot, or uh, we got pro-birther and, you know, Christian <laughs> Taliban and this kind of stuff locally. But, um, you know, when you think about the word racism, it's it's kind of become... For some people, it's become almost a joke, and and I mean that uh, seriously. Like it, it, it feels like everything's racist. You know, like uh, you know, if you look at somebody the wrong way, you look at some of these struggle sessions they put people through, and it's like, well, you just looked at me the wrong way, or you didn't listen well, or you, you know, you talk too much. That's racism. And so, if we want to go back to the Word of God, I don't believe we find the sin of racism, uh, as from the Greek, you know, from, from the Bible, I don't see, see that. I see maybe ethnic partiality as a helpful term, but how might you help somebody see what, is, what exactly is the sin? If we're, if we're going to use the lens of the Bible to look mm -hmm. at these matters in the world, how would you help a Christian understand it biblically there? Yeah, great question. So when this book, uh, Dividing the Faithful came out, we offered a, a free PDF of that in July from our website, Christ Overall, where we did a whole deep dive into the civil rights movement. Uh, what are the things that got right? What are the things that got wrong? What are some things that went the wrong way? And so one of the things I provided there was an article on just defining race and ethnicity biblically. Uh, and so we can ask the question, does the Bible speak of race? It absolutely does. It uses the language of genos. It is thinking about, you know, the, the seed language that is there. And I would argue there are two races in the Bible. One is in Adam, one is in Christ. Therefore, every single one of us, whatever our ethnicity, whatever our skin color, wherever we are birthed from, from uh, we all are of one race in Adam, right? Acts 17 talks about that. That's what we see in the scriptures laid out very, very clearly. But there's also the reality that we must be born again. We must be born from above. And so those who are in Christ, the language speaks of a chosen race, a holy nation, a royal priest. And that's the language of first Peter chapter two. So there's something that is divided in humanity. So if we say that there is only one race, according to the Bible, well, 
I know what people mean by that, and it's their intention is right. But if we want to be biblically specific, there are actually two races that we find in the scriptures, uh, those in Adam and those in Christ. And what I argue in that, that piece is that we should put more weight on our race in Christ, that who we are born again in Christ, because what that does is to relativize the ethnicity, the ethnicity, the different nations, the ethnoi uh, that are there that has all kinds of different uh, applications in the Old Testament. And even Israel, we often talk about ethnic Israel. Um, but one of the things that we see there is that ethnic Israel from the very beginning wasn't a pure ethnic people. Uh, Joseph marries a woman from Egypt. And so there are Egyptian, you know, Abrahamic uh, folks who are in there. So it's a covenant reality. And so we should think biblically about uh, covenants defining peoplehood and nationhood that are there. And so as we think today about people of different skin colors and being from different places around the world, we need to think about ethnicity uh, far more than we do of, of races. Uh, and so I think that's a, a helpful just terminological difference. And of course, you know, someone like uh, John Piper in his book, Bloodlines, will recognize that and then we'll defer to the way that people are speaking today. But we know what racism is. This is how it is used. We talk about race as a social construct, yada, yada, yada. The problem with that is that we're now allowing to the world to define the terms and we are following along with them instead of standing our ground to say, no, we actually need to go back to uh, how scripture speaks. And when we say ethnic pride and ethnic partiality or ethnic hostility, in some ways it takes work to put that out there instead of just the simple racism. Uh, but every time we do that, we're re allowing our minds to be renewed by scripture and fighting against just the pull of culture that is just going to build us into racism. Oh, and now racism is defined as anti-racism, or that's the right way to approach it, or racialization, and on it goes. Yeah, I've seen that play out over and over again. And one of the things, it's funny having these conversations in, in our home, like my wife and I will talk about this stuff and I subject her to podcasts until she can't take it anymore when we're on road <laughs> trips. Yep. Um and so we talk about this stuff often. I, one thing that I think, uh, and maybe you've done this already in the work you, that you've already uh, accomplished, but uh, I don't know if there's been enough uh, investigation into when when do I know biblically if I'm committing the sin of ethnic partiality? Because mm -hmm. I, you know, the way that the world would define it is anytime you uh, you have a, a microaggression or react or have preferences, even if you have certain preferences, mm -hmm. then yeah. then that's a sin. And so, um, you know, maybe I'll suggest something and you can respond to it would be ethnic partiality would be would be when you think that something in your own skin color, in your own ethnic heritage makes you superior to other people in, in kind of their value before the Lord as an image bearer. Is that is that congruent with something you might say or how might you uh, you refine that definition? Yeah, I think that's that's a good starting point. Right. I certainly say that we need to begin where the Bible begins. We were made in the image of God. And so that every single individual is, you know, inherently has dignity um, and that every single person is not greater than another. Uh, and so we can think about this, you know, and maybe less fraught terms of just um, socioeconomic. Right. That the person who is rich and the person who is poor have a similar have the same value uh, before the Lord. And yet I do think that scripture also gives us another category and it's not color, it's culture, that not every culture is the same, that a culture that has been deeply influenced by the, you know, the customs and the laws and the wisdom and the, the righteousness that is found in the Bible is going to have far greater impact uh, of being a healthy culture than those that are not. And we see that in Titus chapter one. Right. So the, the Cretans are, you know, lazy beasts, gluttons, liars. I mean, so he's he's pointing, you know, at stereotypes and he's saying that someone, one of the prophets of your own have said this. So he's recognizing that not every culture is the same. And I think this is something that we're having to recognize in this very day as we're watching, you know, Hamas and what they're doing, that their culture is fundamentally different and not just different, but evil uh, in the way that it is, you know, celebrating the killing of Jews. And so I think that, you know, the multiculturalism that has been, you know, you know, put together over the last two generations is is feeling is experiencing something of the of its death rattle because it can't you can't say any longer what is happening with Hamas and on the worldwide scale, stage uh, that we have something like every culture is the same. It's not. Um, but then 
That doesn't mean that that individual is not made in the image of God and doesn't bear some kind of, you know, respect for that. So there's just the Bible does all that is necessary to bring those things into balance. And we would do well to learn how the Bible weighs those things and speaks. Amen. Yeah. And you see this, I mean, I saw this uh, in London, particularly, it seems to be an epicenter of of this issue where mm -hmm. you see, uh, you know, Hamas supporters marching through the streets, attacking Jewish businesses, hunting Jews, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. And you're like, I think the experiment failed, guys. I think that multiculturalism as an experiment failed. And and so that even gets into, um, I don't know how much divided by faith, because I never, I, I was downstream of divided by faith, the, mm -hmm. the book, I just got like the secondhand literature that came yeah. out of uh, people that were inspired by it. But so much of it, uh, the multicultural attitude is, uh, is pervasive in, in our country and in our churches today. So that one time in seminary, you know, we were talking about Jonathan Edwards and the Puritans and how they treated mm -hmm. different people. And I was like, well, they had a better culture than, you know, the the local uh, Indian tribes. And you would have thought, you know, I, I said a bad word in the mm. class because of the reaction of a lot of people. And I'm like, no, just look. I mean, like, look at the different cultures, the fruit of the different cultures. One, you've got kind of barbarism um, and all these things, these practices going on. Um, and the other, you don't. Now, of course, every culture has its own idols, its own sins. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think that's a really important topic to discuss further and for the church to think clearly about. Yeah. And, you know, certainly the way that Revelation 5 and Revelation 7 has been used to say that the church must look like this. Uh, and I say that is what the church is going to look like when Christ gathers all of his people together, whether that is an imperative for us to make it that way. Well, it's going to depend on where you are. Right? If you're in a place where there's only one culture, if there's only one ethnicity, then it's not going to look like that. That's, that's for the universal church. Now, if you live in a place probably like Boulder or Northern Virginia, you know, our church has only grown uh, in cultural diversity or ethnic diversity over the last five, seven years since, since I've been here. There's not been a program in place. We've just preached the gospel and been as hospitable and loving as we possibly can. And so I think what you have in multiculturalism, though, as a movement, there's a seed of truth in that, or at least it's aping something that God is going to do, right? Satan, who's behind all lies, knows how to, to deceive really well. And so he can't create anything, but he can imitate and ape what God is going to do. And gloriously, God is gathering people from all the nations into one holy nation that is found in Jesus Christ. Um, and so the multicultural movement is trying to do the same thing, but denying God, denying Christ, denying the necessity of forgiveness and grace that is there. And it's trying to kind of tear down any law, any cultural division to say, well, all, all is the same. And it's like, no, it's, it's not the same. There are, there are, there are differences. Uh, and only God can bring people from different backgrounds by death and resurrection into his people in a way that, that will last. Yep. 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 Um, one of the things that you mentioned in the book, one of your uh, theses is uh, regarding confusing the mission of the church. The mission yep. of the church has been something that um, for my listeners, you, you may assume this or know this, uh, you know, something I've I've been really steeped in the miss uh, missional movement, uh, missiology. I was on the tail end when I planted of this fracture between emergent and emerging. There were still papers being written on that at seminary uh, mm -hmm. back in the day that that's definitely dead or at least those terms are dead. The spirit mm -hmm. lives on. But um, but yeah, I was reading Guter and all these people talking about contextualization, how to disenculturate, reenculturate. And, and it really stemmed from my heart for missions. How would I take the gospel to uh, Pakistan or, or the Maldives where I, where I was a missionary? And so mm -hmm. um, that's kind of my background. But this discussion on the mission of the church is a big deal. And so let's mm -hmm. start with, though, on that topic, how, how divided by faith, how does it confuse the mission of the church? Yeah, so I think it uh, asks the church to, well, one, I would say it doesn't even address that question. It just assumes that the church are the best people to go and to improve um, society around them. Uh, you know, the people that they are quoting are not reformed, which is ironic that this book was so widely distributed among reform circles when that's not the theology that is behind it. Um, but it's really a social justice and a social gospel that is behind what they're doing that basically says wherever you see disparity. Uh, wherever you say um, inequality, wherever you see injustice, that is what the church is supposed to go and do. 
And of course, if they were to package that in the terms of social uh, gospel, you know, Walter Rauschenbusch and all the things that came out of the late 19th, early 20th century, then I think there would be an allergic reaction uh, to that. But it wasn't packaged in that way. It was rather saying, look, you know, this division between black and white, the church can do something about that and should do something about that. And by doing that, it co-ops the mission of the church to make uh, this kind of utopian vision uh, today without considering, no, actually, Jesus, who's Lord over all, has commanded his bride to go and to make disciples so that they would receive the gifts of children from the Father into their midst to care for them, to grow them up, to baptize them, to identify them with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, and then to send them out after receiving all the instructions that God has given to them. So I don't think the mission of the church is even at the center of what they're trying to do. And by extension, it then subverts what the mission of the church is uh, that we find from the scriptures. Real quick, when when you mentioned earlier, because it, it kind of dovetails into this topic for me, mm-hmm. is uh, the the topic of CRT. It became kind of mainstreamed. You know, people were talking about it at school board meetings. Uh, yeah. media, media picked it up, and I kept trying to tell people. You know, people would ask me, uh, you know, why are you so passionate against CRT? And uh, and Neil Shinvey did did a service to the church and in, in his research on this topic and, and helped illuminate this issue for me. But they would constantly say, I'm not woke. I'm not uh, you know, I've never even read. I've never even heard of CRT. Uh, how could you accuse me of adopting those languages uh, or those those term the terminology, the framework, the assumptions of, of critical race theory? Um, and so how, how do you think that conversation can go well uh, when you're when you're talking to a pastor? And maybe you don't use CRT. Maybe you just kind of go back to the word of God. What would you suggest is a helpful, because anytime I've brought it up where I'm like, you're pulling from Arcus and it's part of, you know, and I try to go like high level, like ideology stuff. Yeah. It, it becomes overwhelming for the listener. And it, it seems to put too much sand in the gears for them to be receptive to maybe how they've strayed. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I think probably most people haven't been reading, you know, uh, the critical theorists. Uh, but, you know, it's it's in the television. I mean, it's on the Internet. I mean, it's in social media. It's the things that we consume that have been passed down. I mean, that's how cultures always spread uh, along the way. Um, right. I mean, I think about I often will tell, you know, our congregation, you know, people in our church that uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher, the ghost of Schleiermacher, you know, just goes through Christian radio. Right. I mean, this, you know, this God consciousness that has no substance of the gospel whatsoever at all. It's just this feelings of God. It's like nobody's ever heard of Schleiermacher, but he's still around because of the things that he did, you know, 200 years ago. Well, long story short. So I think with those who today, you know, talking about wokeness, if you just want to use that term, say, was there a moment that you woke up to the fact that there are all these disparities? Right. Was there a moment that you woke up and realized that you really benefited from your white skin color going on, that it was more difficult for those with dark skin color uh, in, in our culture? I mean, so we've seen this most recently with Mike Johnson, you know, going back to I think 2020, he had a conversation there and just saying that it is just it is just fact. Uh, that one of my sons has an easier th- than another, right? Because one is adopted and one is his natural born son. Say, so, skin color for me is is a place to ask questions, not to make assumptions, right? There, there certainly is a history that is different in our country for black church experience, white church experience. Let's just put it that way. And so that leads to all kinds of really fruitful conversations when we ask those questions of individuals. But when we take this, this narrative and read it on to particular situations without asking those questions first, um, then I think that is where you are taking critical race theory to say that you are, you know, uh, imposing this grid of thinking instead of saying, oh, I should be aware of these things. I should ask these questions, right? Uh, great friend uh, at our church, you know, African-American brother. We talk about these things all the time. Uh, and just to be able to say that, look, there is a um, an ideology that is put forward out there today. And we need to just go back to the scriptures. We need to think through that even for uh, African-Americans and white Americans, there are different ideologies of conservative and liberal and things in between. Uh, that we need to be thinking about not just skin color, but culture, not just skin color, but just the ideas uh, that stand behind these things. And so, you know, that's where I think a conversation, where, where are you getting these ideas? What's the content of the idea? And does it match up when you read the Bible? That makes sense. So when we think, going back to kind of the topic we're on with mission of the church, yeah. um, you know, there's been a lot of literature about that, a lot of good discussions about it. 
if you were to suggest to me, uh, Chase, this is the mission of the church, how, how much you put language to that? How would you describe it? I think you, you mentioned it earlier, but I just want to hear that again, um, because I want to hear it in contrast to maybe yeah. how I've been taught. Yeah, so I'm, I'm comfortable saying that the mission of the church is the Great Commission, to go forth and to make disciples, right? So the church, the gathered body, um, is the elect lady. So I read, you know, Second John, um, John is writing to the elect lady and her children. So who's the elect lady? I think it's the church, right? There's a, there's a feminine reality there that the church is to be the one who receives the children that God is going to give. How do they do that? They do that by preaching the gospel. Now, that's fundamentally different than saying that the church should be feminine feminine, right? I mean, there's a, right. I yeah, think I there's a gross un misunderstanding that, you know, that needs to fall in that direction, right? No, I think that we need masculine men, feminine women. Um, but there is a sense which that the mission of the church is not to go and do the things that Jesus is doing, but rather to receive what Jesus has done. And as the gospel goes forward, it produces disciples there to then nourish them in the life of the church. Oh, and then they're to send them out as individuals into the culture around them to bring light into all the darkness. They're to go into all the different places that are there. And in that way, the, the church does go go out and have impact as it scatters. But the gathered body, I would say, is to be preaching the gospel, to be discipling the nations as they come in, um, as they're receiving them as the bride of Christ. And so how would that be different? What is like the dividing line between that and maybe the missional approach to the mission of the church? How would, what would you describe that as? Yeah, so I think the missional approach of the church might be found in this. So if a church, um, you know, I would argue that Sunday by Sunday, they gather together for the purpose of remembering the Lord, Lord's Supper, preaching the gospel. Uh, they are a public witness to the resurrection of Christ. This is my great concern for our church and so many churches during COVID and the shutting down of churches. There was not a visible bodily witness of the resurrection of Christ. How is Christ's resurrection bodily displayed today? It's because his people gather on the Lord's day, the resurrection day, Sunday by Sunday, right? So they're, they're doing that. Some churches though say, hey, you know what? We really wanna love our neighbors. So we're not going to gather this Sunday. We're gonna go out and do good deeds. We're gonna go out and do all these different things. And you should do that, that's great. But don't neglect the gathering of God's people to do that. And don't make the mission of the church, you know, the feeding of the poor, the care of the homeless. Like that's not what the mission of the church is. That's what the individual of the church may do. But when you begin to make the entire mission of that one body, those other social justice, social needs based ministries, then you're missing the priority of the preaching word of God the sacraments that are being taken, the church discipline that is there, the public gathering of God's people, those would be some of the distinctions that I would make. Okay, that's really helpful. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. Um, any uh, any place that people can find this, I want to make sure people can pick up the book, I'm assuming Amazon or any, anywhere else that you want to plug uh, for the book to be purchased? Yeah, so it's on Amazon now, right? I mean, so G3 is the one who published it. Thankful for the work that they did there. So you can pick it up from their website. Um, and uh, yeah. All right. And then if people want to keep up with you, hear more of your thoughts, is Christ overall maybe the best place or where, where can they go to hear more from you, David? Yeah. So my uh, my own website is pretty dormant these days. One of these days, I hope to be able to get back to, to write on that. Same. Same. Yeah. That's at davidschrock.com. Um, but yeah, Christ overall, I'm the editor in chief for that. And so, you know, month by month, we're putting out new content there. So I'll write there probably almost every month and happy to, to publish other works like your work uh, before and uh, hopefully again, uh, Christ overall. So yeah, you can find me there. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today, David. Yeah, it's been a joy, brother. Thank you. Hey, if you're a listener and enjoyed this episode, I'd love if you sign up on the Patreon. It's a great way to start conversations, support the show. You'll get early release to all the episodes. You get some swag in there. Sign up at $5 a month. It helps me bring great content to you. Uh, I'd love to make some purchases for the uh, the podcast. As you can see, I've got a, a light coming down from above that on the camera. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, that's merely because I'm using my laptop camera and I don't have enough patrons uh, patrons to support uh, buying a new camera. So I'd love for your help. Sign up there in the show notes. Uh, share this episode with a friend who you think may be going woke or has gone woke. And uh, really, I just want to spark good conversations between Christians that can be biblical and productive and point us all towards Christ. So I appreciate David coming on the show today and we'll see you next time.